Hello everyone, this is Elena Kiria and welcome to Career Diaries by Elamed, the podcast dedicated to sharing the stories behind the inspirational people in the medtech industry. Today, I'm really happy to have Matthias Berger of Zimmer Biomet here with us. So without further, further ado, Matthias, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, Matthias Berger. Um, I currently run the um, quality and regulatory support for our commercial organization in EMEA. Um, I'm the VP of uh, Regulatory and Quality Assurance um, there at Zimmer Biomet. I've been with Zimmer Biomet almost 10 years now, um, but have spent almost 30 years in the medical device industry. I'm a trained biomedical engineer, um, and, and after my studies, I spent time with the Notified Body, actually way at the beginning when the Medical Device Directive came out, so I'm, I'm one of the pioneers, if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, then I changed into consulting. I did consulting for a while, for a few years. And then ever since then, spent my life in industry. Companies like Guidant, Baxter, GE, and uh, Terumo, and now Zimmer Biomed. Wow, so you've really had the chance to kind of work in all different spheres within medical devices. Where, where did it all begin? It all began... It all began when I realized that my original studies, where I studied electrical engineering, telecommunications engineering, was not what I wanted to do in my, in my professional life. I loved engineering. I wanted to be an engineer, <clears throat> but I didn't want to design satellites or create telephones or um, smartphones were not, not on the horizon at that time. And, and these are all important products, obviously, but it, it just wasn't me. I was looking for an engineering profession where I could uh, influence the world, uh, help people, make, make, uh, make people's life better at the mm. end of the day. So I looked into biomedical engineering and medical device technology as, a, as an opportunity. And what I did is I actually went to the Medica um, a trade show in Düsseldorf, uh, you know, one of the biggest in Europe. And um, as I said, it was my final year of engineering. And then just walking the floor there and seeing all these gadgets and machines and, and all this really interesting uh, technology that was there to, to help uh, doctors, but also definitely help patients, I, I was hooked. Mm. And I said, that's what I want to do. Mm. Um, and uh, from that point on, I, I pursued that. So you completed your, your electrical engineering? I, uh, I, I finished electrical engineering in, in Germany, so I got my bachelor degree, if you want, in, yeah. in that. And then I worked two years in academic research. Um, I uh, did that as part of my German, what we call the civil service, so it's an alternate to your, to your military service. And uh, I worked in a in a university in Frankfurt, in the university hospital as a, as a research engineer, uh, building little gadgets for the um, biomedical research they did. Um, and at the same time, then pursued to study biomedical engineering. Originally wanted to do that in Germany, but then I um, was able to get a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship, and I went to the United States, which at the time seemed to, to have more variety mm. uh, at universities in biomedical programs. Germany didn't have a whole lot at the time. And so I, I got my master's from Marquette University mm. in Milwaukee. Nice. And um, I kind of got hooked on the United States there for a while and I returned to Germany, but um, I uh, was looking for a job in the early 90s, mm. and um, it, was, it was quite difficult to find a job at that time. It was mm -hmm. a recession. It wasn't you know, the, perfect, the perfect timing. Um, and then ended up taking a job with TOV Rhineland, going back to, to America, which mm -hmm. originally I didn't even want to do. Mm. And so I left the U.S., and it was kind of, you know, it was hard studies. It put a lot of uh, effort into my, my uh, master thesis at the end, long nights, you know. Mm. People who have been through this know how that is and, and uh, really want to go back to Europe and, and work here. Mm. But this was an opportunity that was great. And so I, I ended up uh, going back. And, and 
maybe when you say where did that all begin actually uh, it all began in a in a cafe at the uh, Bonn uh, Bonn Düsseldorf airport that was my first interview oh really right my boss at the time he was just coming through he was german uh, but he lived in the in the states and he was uh, visiting the, the cologne headquarters of tov and uh, he didn't have much time for interviews so he told me on the phone he said well, just have a coffee at the airport. And I thought, well, you know, doesn't sound like he's taking a lot of effort <laughs> and a lot of time for this. And it's a little bit of a turnoff. And, um, and I think it was the, the, the most interesting interview I ever had because I basically sat down and he said, okay, take out something to write, write out this. You're going to make that much. Here's what you're going to do. You can start then. Here's oh, wow. where you're going to work. And it wasn't so much an interview. It was basically him telling Pitching me, me the job. you know, what it would be. Yeah. So uh, he was an interesting character, actually. Um, and and so, so I think yeah. it's really interesting, obviously, as well, just because you have like an American accent, right? And um, obviously that's because you, early on in your career, you spent that time. And I know that later on in your career, Almost you spent even more. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really interested <clears throat> on the kind of... Um, the the cultural piece right so obviously kind of like having studied in germany you know born in germany lived in germany the first part of your life then you go and you move to the us did you did you get any culture shock or kind of how was that transition from europe to the us it's quite interesting because i think when you go to the us because there's no blatant differences between uh the the western part of europe in the US, as in the cars are maybe a little bit different, but uh, I know you guys drive on the left here, but you know, most, most of the continent doesn't. So they drive on the right side of the road, they, they have cars, they have traffic lights, they, you know, you, you eat very similar food. In fact, you know, American food or fast food, right, has influenced the whole world. So there's nothing absolutely obvious that's different right mm -hmm. i've also been to japan for instance in, in in my professional life and when you go to japan i would say it's like going to mars right it's it's blatantly different yeah, yeah, yeah. right and i mean you can't read anything a lot of the behaviors and i mean it's just different on first sight mm. in the u.s it's not that way the differences between and i would say europe Overall, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of differences in sure. culture in Europe, but the differences between Europe and the U.S. are much more subtle and deeper. Mm. But but that's what makes them even more difficult, mm -hmm. right? The the cultural differences aren't as as obvious, so we mm -hmm. have to learn that. I wouldn't say culture shock. They say when you come back is when you get the culture shock, oh, really? the so-called reverse culture shock. What's that? Well, when you spend. They say when you spend more than five years abroad from your home country, mm. right? That's basically, then when you come back, it feels like something different mm. to you. They say five years is about the time when you then accept another culture and live in it. And then when you come back, it's that reverse culture shock. Mm. So for me, uh, I lived almost 20 years with, with, a, um, with a gap of, two and a half years where I went back to Germany, but then I went again, returned to the US. So overall, it's almost 20 years that I lived there. Wow. I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's definitely really interesting because some of the recruitment that we do, you know, um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking to candidates, <clears throat> there is very much this perception of American companies having a certain culture that is different to European companies and European culture. I don't know if you've ever felt that in some of the companies where you've worked, because I know that they've, you've worked in American companies that have had you know, also very strong European entities. Definitely. American company culture is different. I've, I've worked almost only with American companies, right? I worked for TUV in America, so a German company and very German, right, in mm. the States, but not for very long, three, three years, two, three years. I also worked for a Japanese company in the US. 
And um, I would say Japanese companies are also very different mm. in their culture. Um, but for sure, when I, when I interact with companies, uh, German or Dutch or whatever, be it Philips or Siemens, or your, your few uh, uh, European big medical device companies, I would say yes, uh, American companies' culture, uh, the, the cultures there are of a certain way, mm. right? Mm. And then, and then coming back to like your your story. So obviously, you know, currently you're VP, um, and you started at engineer level, yeah, right. So, on your way up, <clears throat> was there a moment that was particularly defining or difficult for you? I think defining for me, and and maybe not so much for my career but still defining was for me when I worked at TUV I not only did testing of products and later audits and the more typical regulatory and quality work you do at a at a test agency or notified body but I also had to do my own marketing and my own sales I had to acquire oh, yeah. my own my own customers I had at the time later TUV had a little bit of a marketing department but at that time we were completely on our own Right, so I had to go out and figure, okay, what medical device companies are in the territory that I'm covering, which is pretty much the whole U.S. Mm. And then who's there, and how do I reach them? How do I convince them to work with me? Obviously, the the, the medical device directive and CE marketing that came out at the time was a huge opportunity, right? So. We created, there's a, a fellow a colleague of mine at the time who was also pretty, pretty new to TOV. We created a, a uh, breakfast uh, um, training session or education session and then also a two-day program on teaching people about the Medical Device Directive. And obviously it was very, it was brand new, but everybody knew they had to do it. It, it was like the MDR now, now. but even more... Mm. Because there was nothing before, right? Mm. The MDR is the MDD on steroids, mm. right? Mm. But the MDD was was brand new, mm. right? It was like landing on moon, right? It was nobody had done that before. It was a European wide re regulation or directive at the time that didn't exist. Every country had their own regulations before. Um, you know, the quality system element was brand new. The the uh, the ISO nine thousand and then. The, the 46,000 series at the time. Um, so it was relatively easy, actually, get people to come to these sessions because they all wanted to know. And it was good marketing. Mm. But so why was that defining? Because I learned that I wasn't purely interested in being an engineer, right? I, and, and still to this day, I've never really worked outside quality regulatory, clinical compliance, that world. But I'm still very interested in the industry overall, right? I read up a lot on, on uh, business news. Mm. You know, I have a lot of newsletters that I get. Don't always get to read them all, but um, that's interesting for me, right? And I, I, uh, I've always been interested beyond the, just the quality regulatory yeah. piece. I think in terms of med tech, so I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> 3D printing. So I was at an event not too long ago where they, there was a guy talking about the impact of 3D printing and what that meant just generally for the manufacturing industry, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And how, you know, he could imagine that in the future, companies would be able to kind of send specifications to someone who receives it on the other end and then would be able to just 3D print whatever they needed. Yeah. And so then... I kind of was thinking about that, you know, and, and, and also, you know, I, I also heard about uh, this company that now 3D prints houses for yeah, $4,000, yeah, yeah. yeah. right? So it seems to be something that's like super disruptive, just generally all over the world. And so I just wondered, like in medtech, you know, like what's the future of 3D printing in the medtech industry? And do you think that that's going to be particularly disrupt disruptive? You know, it's interesting because the 3D printing, I think overall, has been like the thing that will change the world for the last 10 years. Oh, really? It hasn't really 
totally change the world, but, right? But why not? Well, that's a good question, right? Why was it hyped so much? And, and you look at 3D printing uh, stocks and companies um, that were, were flying high and a lot of them are, you know, have, have gone down drastically. I think there's tons of applications for 3D printing, mm. right? I find it even fascinating that you can uh, print, you know, biological tissue, mm. right? Where they 3D print... Uh, or at least they're on their way to even 3D print organs and yeah. so on. I think that is a, a fascinating um, future there. Mm. But A, I think these things are just not ready for, for a more, um, for broader use, right? This is still in, in a research mode. Mm -hmm. And then 3D printing, I think, has has become a standard manufacturing process in a lot of industries, right? So a lot of things are printed already that we might not even know that they are, hmm. right? But um, in medical, in implants, it's definitely an interesting um, concept and it's used, uh, spinal implants and, and others where that's already being done. Um, but one also has to see that by 3D printing, the the material you create does not have the same, for instance, mechanical uh, structure mm. and capabilities than something that you that you forge, right? right. Or um, something that you cast, right? You know that it's different. Mm -hmm. So I think there is. There's lots of room for 3D printing, and you'll see it more and more. There is already a lot being done, mm. but you can't 3D print everything, mm. right? Because of just the nature of how the material is kind of stacked, you know, layer upon layer and so on. Um, so to me, this is, is a, another piece in our process portfolio that mm. can be used to make products even better or to do to create things we couldn't create before mm. I don't see it replacing everything else I, I doubt that mm. it, the, the one other thing is that you can now make uh, adaptations for specific patients much better yeah. right so the one-offs even the custom, custom made devices yeah. and so on you couldn't do this before mm. as well as you can do it with 3D printing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. What would you say then is is gonna is the major disruptor that's coming in in medtech in the next I don't know ten years? Well, one for sure is artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. That's already happening, um, especially in the diagnostic space. Yeah, for sure. Right? We we it's amazing what we see already interpretations of X rays, EKGs, whatever. So really typical diagnostic space. Um, you see artificial intelligence sometimes being already better than a cohort of, of uh, really specialist uh, uh, medical professionals. Mm. And I gotta say, I mean, when, when I worked for GE, right, we, have a, we had an EKG um, management system. It was a software, basically, that, that GE sold, was, was very um, popular in the market. And, and uh, it helped um, cardiac departments interpret EKGs, mass reading of EKGs, um, giving the doctors maybe like a pre, um, um, a pre read if you want, mm. saying we, we detect certain things in EKG. It might be this. It wasn't it wasn't AI in a way, but it was intelligent. It had algorithms that would detect certain things, and AI to me is just a you know, a continuing development in that. So I, I see AI going to be big, very big, together with big data, right? Yeah. It gives you opportunity of <clears throat> creating also um, better treatment plans, you know, for hospitals, kind of, you know, how do you, you know, let's say a typical um, typical case in the in an emergency room, how do you go about it, right? These standard treatments, these standard protocols, AI and big data will, will help you, you know, create better protocols and better algorithms mm. on, on what you're going to do with somebody when they come in and, 
they're just bleeding and they're unconscious and you, you don't know right away what it is. <clears throat> so I see that one. Um, and that one is so interesting, right? Because I think from, I, I, there's a few companies out there kind of in that space yeah. that I've been following as well. I won't drop any names right now, but you know, from, from everything that I can see, the technology is there, right? Where like the technology can diagnose, but what I see is more that people aren't ready for it, you know? Um, I would agree with that. That, right? that kind of like now it's more of a, an aid to diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking with someone the other day that, and I found this really interesting. So the role of doctors in the future, right? So at the moment, obviously doctors are there, you know, they, they, they diagnose, you know. Um, but if we get AI in and civilization is ready, you know, for AI to be the thing, you know, that makes the diagnosis... Um, it almost, what, what, what will then be the future of a role of a doctor? You know, what, where do they play now or where will they play? And also the thing that I found really interesting is, is the thing that can't be replaced by technology or AI. And by the way, I'm not saying that doctors will be, I'm just putting that on the record, but you know, kind of nurses mm -hmm. and the more human aspect of healthcare, yeah. that is almost, you know, going to be even more important in the future, I absolutely. think, because that's where the focus will be. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. But I don't see AI as taking the doctor's role. AI is Surely a tool, not. right? Yeah. A highly sophisticated tool. AI in itself, by the way, is nothing. It's, it's, it's just mathematics and, and, and computer engineering. Mm. But AI is a, is a concept, right, that you can integrate into diagnostic tools and in, in other ways give doctors tools. So that's one. Robotics, by the way, is similar. I mean, obviously we see, we see a big uh, <clears throat> movement into robotics right now in, in all spaces of surgery mainly, right? I think that is here to stay. I think that's growing. But I think with robotics, we have to first see what, what is it really that uh, the surgeons want. There's so many different approaches right now. I think it will take a few years to kind of crystallize where this will be going. But it's, it's you know, I, I think one other tool that helps a surgeon in that case, mm. right? A lot to concentrate on what's more important, what I need the surgeon, the doctor for. Mm -hmm. and, and absolutely right what you just mentioned with the nurses, the, the human piece right of healthcare is actually is is decreasing you know in the, the last whatever let's say 30 40 50 years mm -hmm. right because we have the pressure on the doctors you know to to have more patients right there's healthcare cost pressures so what happens right your, your doctor especially in a hospital he sees you or she sees you maybe 15 seconds, mm. right? Mm. I mean, I was recently uh, uh, in the hospital last year, right, uh, for a small operation and uh, spent a, a few days in the hospital. And then you realize how important that human interaction is. Totally. The nurses definitely, right, just how they treat you and how they interact with you mm. makes a difference how you will be mm. healing, mm. right? Mm. Uh, somebody might say, no, they just hand you the medication and they, they take your, your pulse and your blood pressure and whatever. But there's way more to that, right? Mm -hmm. There's the, the, the empathy, right? There's the, the, the emotional part that absolutely supports the healing, right? Um, but with the doctors, they usually come in and you, you can ask them maybe one question, right? And they're gone again. Mm -hmm. So if we can create tools that give the doctors more time to spend with the patients mm -hmm. and less with the machinery, right? And less with the, the diagnostic, the pictures and the, you know, the, the lab results and all of that. If, if the tools, you know, do some of that pre-work for the doctor, the more time, ideally, a doctor should have for that human interaction. Mm -hmm. And that will never go away. Mm, definitely not. And I right? think... and, and keep in mind, right? Medicine, they say, is an art, not science. Oh, really? Uh, medicine diagnosis, for instance, is, it isn't black and white. 
this isn't like you can do in electrical engineering. You can take a voltmeter and it, it tells me how many volts it is. And it, depending on my instrument, it's precise, mm. right? Uh, even with all the diagnostic tools, it's a statistical thing, right? Mm. It's most likely that patient has this disease, but it could be something else, right? Mm. So coming back to, I guess, kind of, you mentioned that you were, you were recently um, in, in the hospital. Um, obviously, how was that? Just because you're working in the medical device industry, yeah. was there anything kind of specific that you noticed or thought about? Oh, you look at everything. They, they, they look, you look at everything that they use on you or, or um, that, that is sitting around and you first check whether the CE markings on there, right? And then uh, you obviously see products you might have worked with in the past. Or for me, I've worked with a lot of different products. And then you see products, either your own that you've maybe worked with yourself or from, from your former competition or so. And obviously, as a biomedical engineer, you understand a lot of the instrumentation around you much better than mm. a normal patient. Um, I guess say the, other, the other thing though, that I thought about, and I've talked about this before, is that you know we we take our our um, devotion to patient safety right mm. and to 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 high quality and and, and 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 ethical work very very serious right and you sit there as a patient and now you are at the receiving end right yeah. and you just it goes to your mind you go well I hope that particular company that makes this product is as serious about safety as we are right yeah. and and uh, again once you are a patient then you feel this much different right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you think about things they use on you and you go oh, hopefully was that really sterile and uh, <laughs> uh, but things that a normal patient doesn't even know right so yeah. Does it make you a better or worse patient? I don't know. I, I you know, maybe maybe worse patient yeah. because you know more. Sometimes right? better. Be, yeah. what, what's the what's the the phrase? Ignorance but, is bliss. Yeah, ignorance is bliss. Yeah, that's exactly. it. That's it. Um, so interestingly, I, I mean, something I've always wanted to ask you actually. So obviously, Zimmer Biomet, big company, um, VP, <coughs> big role. Yeah. How how big is your group today? Or in the past, you've led groups. In the in the past, ahead like up to 900 people. So big, right? Yeah. So so my question is is how do you manage the pressure? Because yeah. it's a lot of responsibility. Yes. Yes, and there's there's two forms of pressure, right? On one hand there's that pressure that you feel responsible. You should re feel responsible for these people working for you. I mean, they don't all work directly for you, but mm. you uh, what you do and whether you do it well will influence their their professional life, mm. right? Obviously, the, any company you work for too, but the people in your team, right? The the way you act will will uh, we say cast a shadow, right? The people will look up to you. They will mimic what you do. Mm. It's perfectly normal. So there's a lot of pressure of how do you behave, what do you do. Um, and, and how does it impact the people? You know, sometimes there you have to let people go. Sometimes you have to downsize. All of these things you go through, that, that, that is a lot of pressure because there's, there's lives, there's families, and there's stories behind that. Mm. And then the pressure comes, obviously, in any company, right? You, you need to be successful. New products need to be on the market, right? There's the, the business piece of it. How do you deal with that? It's hard to say. I mean, for me, <clears throat> the moment you perceive it as pressure, mm. I think you you have to think about how you work and, and whether this is right for you, right? There's, there's positive stress and negative stress. If the negative stress becomes too big, then you need to think about, well, is, do I do it the right way? Um, do I approach it the right way? Is this the right thing for me? Mm. Positive stress pressure, um, you know, that gives you energy, right? So you have to, to find a way a, to make the pressure help you get energy, right? And, and, and see 
don't see the, the challenge, but see the opportunity. I know that's, uh, you know, maybe overused, but, but truly is. So you have to see the, what can I do? And, 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 and how can I develop my people? What, what, how can I positively grow them, right? Those things. Um, but what does that actually look like? So, so yeah. I'm just trying to imagine and, and thinking about trying to give people, you know, actionable advice that, you know, if there's somebody listening to this yeah. right now that is under some form of pressure right. uh, from a leadership perspective, yeah. let's say, yeah. like, what does that actually look like? Are you sitting by yourself in a room and actually kind of doing a bit of self-talk? Are you taking some time out to reflect? I mean, how, how, how do you actually make that happen? Well, for me personally, I think everybody's different, right? Mm -hmm. For me personally, I need to talk to people. I, for me, too much reflection, it, it doesn't work well for me. I need somebody to, I need to let it out, right? I need to sometimes vent. Sometimes you just look for somebody to vent. Mm. And that can be a, a peer at work, it can be a friend, it can be a spouse, whatever, right? You, you, uh, you, you, you got to find the right person for that. Um, but also what, what works well for me is to discuss with my team, right? The, the challenge is you, you're not alone, right? So if you have 900 people working for you, you got 901 who can work on the issues, mm. not just you. In fact, anybody in a leadership position who thinks they have to do everything themselves or they are too they, they cannot delegate well, they cannot, uh, you know, make others do the work, you're in the wrong position, mm. right? My job is not to get everything done. My job is to orchestrate. It's a little bit like, a, like a, you know, the, the, the conductor mm. with the orchestra, right? He's not running around playing the violin <laughs> and then going to the drums and then jump over and play the bass or, or the trumpet or whatever. He... And he's very important, and he is often right. If you go to a, to a concert, that's the, the celebrated person, right? And and for us, when we listen, we think, well, what is he doing, right? He's just waving, waving that stick, waving that stick a little <laughs> bit, right? Big deal, right? The the people doing the work are is the orchestra, and that's true. Yeah, he's not making the music. I actually love but that. But it's a energy. really important part, and that's why the conductor gets so much applause and everything, right? So when you and and I'm, you know I'm not in that for the for the applause, but what I'm saying is, as a leader, right? It isn't about you anymore, mm. right? It, or or your skill sets or how well I know CE marketing. Obviously, it's good if you if you know your area, but it's about the people who you work with and how you get that team to accomplish something that a single person or a collection of single people could not accomplish. It's such an interesting analogy because I speak, you know, I, I focus specifically on recruiting director and VP level roles. And I speak to a lot of people about leadership. And I think that's the first time that someone has directly associated it with being a conductor of an orchestra. But it's, it's, it's so that it's setting the tempo. It's, you know, bringing out the, the focus teams when they're needed. It's knowing who is the best person for what and, and putting the spotlight on them, isn't it almost? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's such, I love that analogy. And it, it really feeds into, I guess, like the other thing that I wanted to ask you, which was, you know, somebody who maybe is early on in their career right now, who kind of has that target of being a leader in a big global medtech organization, what would you say is kind of like the, the key thing that you need to have to be <clears throat> successful in such a role? I would actually say one of the key things is empathy. Mm. you work with so many different people they're all different and empathy and the ability to appreciate everybody in their own style and 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 skills and all of that right we do a lot of um you know these these uh what you call them characterization methods you know like insight mm -hmm. and and, and uh, things that describe what kind of person you are. Are you more driver? Are you more analytical? Are you more people person? You know, and there's different approaches for this, right? There's, as I said, insights, one of them, but there, there's many others. And I think 
empathy for people because they are human beings at the end of the day. And the work we do, the work that most of us do is about human interaction. I mean, if you're, if you're an engineer, yeah, you might construct a little gadget. Or if you are somebody who's, who's building something, if you're a painter or a carpenter, right? You, you do something with your hands, you, you build things. But when you look at the majority of jobs in offices, it's about human interaction. Mm. It's some form of communication. It's some form of convincing you of something. There's always a little bit of a sales process in there, right? Mm -hmm. It, but what is that? It's communication at the end of the day. Mm. And for me, empathy is really important because if I don't have empathy for you as a person, I will not understand you. It doesn't, I don't know what drives you. And then now I'm going back to this personality profiling. There's so many different types of people. And only when you have a little bit of everything will you have a really great team. Mm. If you have teams and they're all the same, they're all drivers, 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 right? Then you'll have a lot of energy, but you might not have great ideas. You might, you might, everybody might just run one direction, but whether that's the right one or not, the analyticals aren't there to tell you, oh, oh no, 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 you got to turn left yeah, here. Yeah. You need them all. And, and as a leader, you got to be able, because you're, you're one of the profiles. Mm. You're typically you know, a little more of a driver, a little bit more, more of an analytical, what, whatever you are. But if you learned to appreciate diversity, and, and that's, you know, maybe another piece or another word, word, if you learn to appreciate diversity and with empathy, learn to, to really listen to people, then you will accomplish things. And then it doesn't really matter whether you're in QA, it doesn't even matter whether you're in medical devices. To me, that's just about leadership. Mm. And it's so important when it comes to, to hiring that you do hire people that might not have necessarily the same views because some, or definitely not the Absolutely. same background. Because it's really important to have those dissenting voices around Absolutely. the table. Because they, they uncover your blind spots, yes. you know, yes. and I think as humans, naturally, and, and, and I think this is why diversity is, is becoming such a hot topic. And I'm not just talking about kind of like gender or race diversity. Yeah. I'm talking about yeah. diversity of thought. Exactly. Um, and, and that's so important because otherwise you end up just hiring people that you personally like or that are like yeah. you. Exactly. And as you say, you end up with a team where everybody is the same and then nothing actually gets done. Yeah. Um, or so, the wrong things get done. Or the wrong things, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so coming back to obviously kind of like <clears> your story. <throat> biggest regret? Biggest regret. Not biggest regret, but maybe something I learned from my behavior, okay. right? There were, there were a couple of stations in my, my career where I, where I jumped to something else, um, and and there was always growth, right? Typically, the, the or not typically, the, the the steps I've taken from company to company have have been career moves where I, where I grew either in responsibility or I broadened my my knowledge. Or it, it, there was always a growth element in every step that I took, but earlier on. I took a couple of steps, maybe a little too early, right? And I was kind of, I was impatient. Um, I was impatient and I felt, okay, in this company, I will not get that next promotion and I'm ready. And it hasn't hurt me. So that's why it's not regret, mm. right? Because I, all these steps turned out well for me. But when I look back, um, giving it a little bit more patience might have worked too, mm -hmm. right? So again, less regret, but but learning that you cannot run away when when things you know get a little tough, or or when you feel you're not as appreciated, or when you feel you're not uh, promoted as much as as you think you're ready, right? And so, as an advice, I think. It would be to to people who are earlier in their careers to 
kind of give it a little bit more time. Obviously, if you're if you're in a toxic situation, if you're in a toxic environment, right, then get out, right? No, nobody should do that. If it's bad for your health, if you if you really if you feel it impacts you or or your family or whatever, then then get out. Especially mm. if if you can get out, right. But if it's more of a well, I'm here for a year and a half now, and I'm I'm not VP yet, and I was for and I started as an engineer, right? Then you know, give it a little more time. Be a little bit more patient, um, and I think that a little bit of that comes with age, right? You you just kind of you you, you uh, uh, become a little bit more mellow, and and uh, because you've seen so many things that you say, okay, yeah, we've been through this before. It, it's fine. It'll go away. How important do you think career planning is? Because, you know, I speak to I speak to people nowadays, you know, early on in their careers that will say to me, OK, I want to do this for two years and then I'll do that. And it's almost like they've got it all planned out. And I just know from kind of my recruitment experiences and even how my own careers turned out <coughs> that sometimes the best things happen when you don't plan them. I'm interested to know if you if you had a plan and if you have a plan now. So I'll, I'll, I'll say something maybe a little radical. I think career planning doesn't work. Okay. And, and I know, that's a little over the top and, and most likely not, not totally true. But, but you're right. I think there's certain things you need to try and answer for yourself as you go in your professional life. And one of them is, do I like to manage people? Mm. Right? Am I a... Am I a more for a technical ladder? Am I a specialist in something? Am I, am I good at a, at a specific craft, right? Do I want to perfect that? Uh, do I want to become a fellow engineer, somebody who's hopefully also very well um, uh, respected in a company? Or do I enjoy working with people? And then I go into management. That is a key decision. And, and you can't make that when you're 19, right? And I don't know. Some people can make it at twenty, maybe, but but some only at forty, right? There is no there's there's no rule to that. But I think that's something to think about as you go into uh, your your next assignments and so on as you as you develop. Do I like working with people? And that means to me not only managing them in the more traditional way of telling them what to do. That that's a big element of it. But also, do I enjoy Again, developing them. Do I have enough empathy? Because working with people, people have good days and bad days and so on. And you you need to have that stamina. You need to have that patience. You need to have that willingness to work with them through all of that. Mm. They're not machines. They're not AI. They're human. So I think that is really important. Other than that, career planning, I think it works to the extent that if you say, hey, I want to go into r and I'm a development guy, I want to develop products and I want to grow in that, um, then, then go for that route. But I tell you, my career was, I don't want to say, totally unplanned. But I ended up in QAR because it was my first job. Mm. And when I go back to that, sitting in that cafe, right, when I asked my, my first then boss, so what will I do there? What what?" What do you guys actually do there at the notified body or at the test house? And he said, well, you take a printer and you pluck the print head and you see whether it catches fire. <laughs> and I've never done that in my life, ever, in that time or whatever. <laughs> so, so I'm not saying he was lying to me or anything, but he chose an example that sounded extremely boring, <laughs> was, was not appealing to me at all. And I went out of there and said, like, that's what I want to do. And that's why I got a master's degree in biomedical engineering for, really. Right? And again, I, I never tested a printer in my life. Right? But what I'm saying is you, you sometimes get pushed or pulled in a direction that you didn't plan. And I would say, hey, if it feels right or it feels exciting or you are curious about it, go. Mm. I, you know, coming back to the regret, maybe one of my regrets is that not earlier in my career I have 
uh, gone into, let's say, marketing or general management or even sales or, or something uh, related, right? Because I sometimes feel now, and you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a pyramid, right? But when you're kind of pretty far to the top there, it, it it's really hard to, to switch to something else, right? Mm. You you are in a silo, and the the higher you go up in that silo, the harder it is to say, hey, uh, I would do, I would love to do a business development mm. or this, that, and the other. So. But it still, it's not a regret because I had a good career. I was successful, so it's not something that held me back. Mm. But I find if you're curious about something, and even if it feels a little weird, but but you, it's exciting, go for it. That's where you learn as That's well. It, it, I mean, it, not quite your 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 question, but I find that one other really important point when you think about new jobs and something that guides me when i uh, when i look at a new job i look at it and i go does that make me nervous or do i feel hey i can do it in my sleep mm. if i feel mm, that's easy i can do it in my sleep it's not the right thing for me to do as a next step because mm. then there's no stretch there's no growth do i look at it and i get a little nervous and i go oh my god can i really do this then it's the right thing to do. Yeah, being right. uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Get out of your comfort zone, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, okay, so, so here's a question. So what do you do? So do you read? Don't tell anybody I can't read. <laughs> no. I, uh, yes, of course I read. Um, but, you know, self-help. I read emails, right? Like... <laughs> um, no, you mean books, right? Yes. Um, I do read books and... and uh, what are you reading right now? It, uh, I'm reading one right now. It's called Quality Land. And okay. it's a, it's kind of a quiet, black humor, um, uh, almost a dystopia of the future, right? Of, a, of a, another universe land or whatever, whether it's in the future or just somewhere else where... A lot of the things we have nowadays, like social media, uh, Amazon, online ordering, and so on, and they basically take this to an extreme in this book. It's, it's, it's a, it's not quite a comedy because it you 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 want to laugh, but it's it's a, some of it's quite sad, and you 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 cannot laugh anymore. But it's you know it's a dystopia kind right, of right, right. kind of book, and. Um, and I bought it because of the title, right? It said Quality <laughs> Land. It was be a quality I'm like, book. oh, this must be a book for me. I, I, I sometimes do that. I buy books and because the title seems appealing and then I see what it is, right? I'm a, I'm a curious person as it is. I, I actually don't read a lot of business books. Why not? Um, why not? Because when I read, I read really more for relaxing, mm. enjoyment. This is what what brings me down what what helps me relax when i if i read a lot of business books and so on it doesn't help me relax um yeah sometimes you know it it, it would be good to know all these things the, new, the, the newest business strategy the newest this and that um but I think everybody needs to needs to decide that for themselves. I think it isn't absolutely necessary to do this, especially as so many so many elements of what we do is common sense. Yeah. If you have good common sense, and I think I have pretty good common sense, that helps you in a lot of situations. And often the the biggest book will not help you with that, right? Um, and it doesn't, and, 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 and I'm not trying to say, you know, there are not good books out there and there's new things to learn and so on, but by all means. But for me, reading is really more for enjoyment. Mm. And that's why I typically pick, you know, stories, uh, fiction, uh, thrillers, whatever. Um, I, I read occasionally biographies, mm -hmm. but even there I find that's sometimes too... It's quite heavy, though. Biographies. Too heavy, right? Yeah. I, I used to listen to a lot of books on tapes. Mm. I, I, in, in the time in America, I used to drive 
um, I used to commute to uh, between Michigan and, and Chicago, and that's about a five-hour drive. And so, you know, at some point in time, you get bored listening to the top twenty, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially after five after five hours, you heard every song three times, right? And so I, I I rented books on tapes from the library actually and would listen to them and and I found that the best for that purpose was to listen to kind of more more books for young adults okay because that level of 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 uh, language and, and story and so on it was easy to digest and you could still concentrate on driving and I remember listening to Bill Clinton's biography and I I got it just. I couldn't drive anymore. I, I had to focus on, on what was said so much that I couldn't concentrate on driving, turn it off. And so I needed something that was more kind of background, background noise. and uh, yeah, back, not quite background noise, but something you could listen to, like if you talk to somebody in the car, right? And um, I don't know how people do that though, actually. You know, I, are they talking cars? No, uh, Matthias, but like for example, how, how you can listen to something in the background and talk at the same time. Oh, no, I mean, but what I'm saying is that, you know, when you when you have just normal conversation, when you drive with somebody, you typically don't discuss, you know, something very technical or very intense, right? It's more yeah, yeah, just general conversation. Yeah. So that's how the book needed to mm, be. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, so. I've got a big question for you. Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've really explored your career, kind of uh, challenges, you know, advice. That's all. That's all well and good. But what is what is the legacy that you want to leave on the world? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's too late to build a second Amazon or something like that, <laughs> right? Although you never know. What we would do with hindsight, though, um, right? And so, for me, I've asked myself that too. Not you know, not every day, but that you know, sometimes you go and say, okay, well, what? Oh how would somebody know you once you're gone and, and outside your family, right? So for me, legacy A is with my children, mm -hmm. right? I want to make sure that I give them the adequate support and, and help and be there for them to develop good lives and whether they want to have a career or not, um, but be supportive there. So legacy for me, first of all, is, is my children for, for starters. But then also the people the people I have touched right throughout my life and that and a lot of that is in my career because you spend so much time at work right that's where you touch a lot of people and when I see people that I've worked with and helped to find their way and figure out what they wanted to do and then when they come back after a few years and say yeah, man I remember when we talked about my next step uh, I remember one engineer I worked with in the States who was was set on on getting a, um, a master's degree in engineering. And I told him, I said, when I listen to you, the things you want to do that you're interested in, why do you want to do more engineering? You're a very good engineer already, although you just, quotes, have a bachelor. You're a very good engineer. But all the things you're saying, you're talking about, they scream MBA, right? Mm. You want to go in business, you want to learn about marketing, all of these things. Why would you do a master's in engineering? Go get an MBA. And he did, and he's like a director level or so at Amazon actually now. He's doing something totally different, not, not biomedical, anything anymore. But, you know, he came back after years and he said, wow, I'm so happy we had this conversation. Mm. I would have gone off and be more engineer, more engineer, more engineer. And this totally changed my life, right? That to me is legacy, right? So if I can touch a few people like that and make them grow and, 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 and develop their life and their careers and so on, I'm not sure people will write books about that, but, but that to me is something you leave behind. Mm, wow, well, and I think that's one of, the, that's, that's one of the, the, the best things that you could actually do you know to actually impact someone in such a way that their life takes such a complete turn and it's thanks to something that maybe you suggested to them that they had never right. ever thought of right.
Well, look, so that, that's all the, all the time that we have for today because you need to catch a flight, don't you? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Matthias, for joining us on this, on this podcast. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, share your comments, your thoughts and your questions, uh, especially on LinkedIn. And um, I'll be back soon with another podcast, with another discussion from another leader in the medtech industry. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening and take care. Bye-bye.